we got a big weekend, you know, I, I got to tell you a few things about my journey. Some of you know that I've always been a fireworks fanatic, right? I, I need you to know, I did not go to the town of Smyrna fireworks on Friday night. Like, you know, I don't know, oh, I, I've not missed that in like 20 plus years. Are you ready for this? I am not planning to go to downtown Nashville tomorrow night. What? Yeah, I know, shocker. I, I don't, nothing's happened. I'm just, I'm just like, I, I need a, I, I'm old. Yeah, you know, all the things I'm hearing right now, intervention, I'm old, yeah, whatever, all those things are probably true. You know, I'm just going to take a sabbatical for one year. However, I am coming here tonight uh, to celebrate with you through a fireworks display that I'm sure will be absolutely great, depending on what you're looking for. Uh, but because we're not going to spend like $10,000 as a church on fire. I'm just telling you right now. Um, but it's going to be great. And the fellowship and the hanging and Kona ice, it's all going to be good. Come on. Uh, I was telling Lloyd and Becky Lynn, they were in the first service. <clears throat> I had a dream last night. And I said, this must be prophetic. I dreamed that you all came and you brought a food truck to the fireworks. And that they were just like giving out hot dogs and hamburgers to everyone. So I asked the question, yeah, are you doing that? And they were like, no. <laughs> You're on your own, friends. Bring your own picnic. I don't come near what I'm bringing. We'll see how it turns out. I am going to, as soon as I get home from church, I'm going to smoke some ribs. You know, the whole three, two, one method. I figure they'll be ready right in time for this. If they're great, I will not share any of my ribs with you. If they're average, come see me. I'll hook you up with a rib. But uh, anyway, my wife's like, really, you're doing that? Now you know. Now you know what we're bringing tonight. We had options. I, yeah, okay, I'm not here to talk about that. <clears throat> Today, we're uh, con con <laughs> continuing in the book of Ephesians. Uh, we've made it all the way through part of chapter 3. Today, we're going to look at only eight verses. Uh, we're going to start in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 14, only eight verses because we've really, you know, there's so much to preach in the book of Ephesians. I'm like, I got it. We got to scale this back a little bit to redeem some time because we've been going over. And then we always have the Monday morning staff meeting. And Anna's like, my, my workers, they're only prepared for an hour. You know, all, all that conversation plays out. So we're going to redeem some time today prayerfully. We'll see. The Holy Spirit could intervene and all that could be just thrown out the window too. But when I think about uh, what we're going to look at today, Ephesians 3, beginning of verse 14, this is a prayer that Paul prays for the church at Ephesus. And so I've been reflective this week on my own life when it comes to prayer. Some of the most meaningful times, I'm going to guess you would agree, are times when an individual or a small group of people has prayed over you. Like, it's, it's moving. And I have received that many times. It's always such a blessing. Uh, I think about sometimes in our, our hope groups, our small group ministry that we call hope groups. I don't know what happens at yours, but there have been times in our group where someone is just sharing from the heart. They're going through some trials, some difficulties, some overwhelming consequences of life. And in the moment, it just all you really feel like the appropriate thing to do is just to stop everything and gather around an individual and pray over them. And like, I have never, ever been a part of that where we took that step of faith and did that, that we were like, ah, oh, that was dumb, regret doing that. Like, it's meaningful to, to pray with that type of intentionality. Uh, I thought about, you know, when, when Hope was new and we didn't have a home, we did Intro to Hope all over the place. And in one of the seasons, we did Intro to Hope at Carpe Cafe down there by the depot in Smyrna. And um, we had several of them at Carpe, and I remember a girl that was a part of that Intro to Hope in her 20s, and uh, she just wanted to talk. You know, the Carpe people were like, get out of here. You know, we, we want to lock the doors and go home. So we went outside on that little patio area, and we sat, and we talked to her for a while. And it became very evident very quickly that she, she needed prayer, but she didn't either know how to or desire to verbally ask. It was just the girl and, and my wife and I. She didn't ask for prayer, but it, we, we just said, hey, we feel like everything you're going through in the season of life, can we just pray over you? 
And so we, we did that. She said, sure, absolutely. I will never forget what she said after that prayer with tears in her eyes. She was weeping. She said, listen, that is the first time in my life that anyone has ever verbally spoken a prayer over me. You think about that, church. You know what that means? Like all the way back, even when she would have been a toddler, and oftentimes there's a mom, a dad, a grandma, a grandpa, somebody who is praying over a child, that means that had never happened, not even that. And so in Ephesians chapter 3, not only do I want you to look at this prayer with me, but I really want you, I want you to receive this prayer today. Well, what do you mean by that, Kent? This is a sermon, not a prayer. I know. But maybe what would help you, if you could like envision, if there's one or maybe two people in your life that have really had an influence on you coming to know Jesus, helping you mature in your faith, maybe as we read this text, you could envision that individual kneeling down with you and actually praying this prayer over you. That might help as you really think about the significance of this prayer. So look with me, Ephesians chapter 3, beginning in verse 14. We'll break it down and walk through this together. Paul writes to the church, For this reason, I kneel before the Father. And so, you know, we got to tackle this. For this reason, we ask the question, like, what reason? <laughs> what reason? For this reason, I'm going to kneel down and pray. Well, Paul, for what reason? And so basically all we have to do is look backwards as he writes this letter to the church. Look backwards to chapter 1 as we ask why, for what reason. And you'll see real quickly why. Because we have been chosen and adopted. That's part of the why. Why? Because we have been redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ. Why? It's because we have been sealed with the Holy Spirit of Almighty God. Yeah, those are some of the reasons why. Then you flip to chapter 2, Ephesians chapter 2. Why? Remember, because even though we were dead in our sin, y'all, dead is dead. Even though we were dead in our sin, Christ made us alive. So here again, for what reason is Paul bowing down and kneeling to pray? It's because, chapter 2 tells us, we have been saved by grace. We were far from God, now we're near. We were without hope, and now we have hope and, and peace. So here's Paul. Mike Murray referenced this last week. Basically a terrorist, very anti, I want to hurt and kill Christians, and now his confession is, I have been forever changed by Jesus Christ. So maybe, maybe you couldn't think of a person that's been such an influence on your life that would kneel down and pray over you. Think about this one. Imagine it's the Apostle Paul now who is bowing down, just you and the Apostle Paul. He's bowing down, you're both kneeling and he speaks and prays this prayer over you. He says, for all of these reasons, I kneel before the Father. We'll start there. Let's just tackle that. Think about all the different stances, different postures we could take on as we pray. You know, we, we could pray. Man, you can just stand up and pray with hands lifted high in the air. I highly recommend you do this in the middle of Walmart. Just walk through Walmart. Don't even close your eyes. Walk it around, hands in the air. Just pray into the Lord. And, and then just see what happens. I don't know what's going to happen. I have no idea. I'm kind of trying to be funny here, but nobody's laughing. <laughs> we could pray like that. It's totally fine. God will receive that prayer. We could do what seems very comfortable. Bow our heads. You can do that standing. You can do that sitting down. You could lay prostrate on the ground, our face to the floor, or you could just 
kneel before God. In Ephesians chapter 3, this is what Paul does. He kneels before the Lord in prayer. Well, what does that even mean? And what, is it, what does it mean to get down and, and to like kneel before the Lord in prayer? Like, seriously. Like, just the fact that I'm doing this got some of your attention because what does this say? It's like humility. It, it's, it's taking a posture before the Lord where, where you're acknowledging His goodness and His greatness and, and who He is. Do you, well, can't, do I have to do that? Do I have to kneel to pray? No. You, you don't have to kneel to pray. But again, what is that all about? It's about humility. It's about understanding who God is, who we are in a relationship with the Lord. Look again. For this reason, I kneel before the Father. And look what Paul says in this prayer. From whom every family, every family in heaven and on earth, derives its name. Now, here again, all he's tapping into is what Paul just said leading up to this prayer. We, Mike talked about it last week, that salvation is available to anyone and everyone, available to the Jews, available to the Gentiles, available to the Tennessee Vol fans, available to the, Vol the, the Vanderbilt Commodore fans. Available to the Florida Gators. Yeah, boy. I got hit up. You know, I'm an Oklahoma guy, but not a Sooner. My wife and I both graduated from Oklahoma State. And both she and, and I don't know if you know Phil and Natalie Wilson. Phil Wilson is also an Oklahoma State grad. Both of them come to me after the service and like, what? You're not going to talk about our, our Oklahoma State Cowboys where we all went to college? And not and the Sooners, you know, oh, the Sooners. Oh. Anyway, salvation is available to all. And, and Paul says that all these people, no matter who you're cheering for on a Saturday, we all owe our existence to God. Maybe you're not into sports and you want to break it down into Democrats, Republicans, pro-choice, pro-life. Everything that has breath. Everything that has breath in heaven and earth, Paul says, we, we owe our gratitude to God because he is the father of all things. This is what he says in the very first of this prayer. If you keep going, verse 14 and 15, I want you to think about this posture of prayer that Paul takes. Like what I see is complete humility. Paul teaches us to kneel before our Heavenly Father, acknowledging that He is the only reason we are even alive. Now, I, I understand, I think very well, that when I talk about prayer, there are a few of you who even today would say, Kent, here's the deal. If you had this one-on-one -on -one conversation with me, you might say something like this. Here's the deal. I know you're talking about being humble before the Lord to pray. Kent, I'm mad at God. Like, like, I don't sense that the Lord has answered my prayers. Not only do I not want to pray with a posture of humility, Kent, I don't want to pray at all. You might even say, I gave up praying months or even years ago. That is quite possible. Yet, in this text we see Paul modeling something very different. Y'all, uh, how many of you, just by raising hands, saw the movie at some point, maybe multiple times, Forrest Gump? Surely, yeah, I'm like, that's, that's one that most people have seen. And then I would ask this question, do you remember the character Lieutenant Dan? Yeah, and here come the quotes right now. You should, you should have my perspective to hear. Here come the quotes. If you remember Lieutenant Dan, there was a scene in the movie, it's a pretty short scene, where Lieutenant Dan and Forrest are out on the shrimp boat. And you remember why they were out on the shrimp boat? A, a hurricane was coming in, right? Lieutenant Dan is the dude who is super mad at God. And in this scene, when they're out in this massive storm, Lieutenant Dan 
is screaming at the top of his lungs. And he, he basically yells out to God, You call this a storm? I, I played the clip back this week so I wouldn't mess up what he said. Some of the things he said I won't share. <laughs> and after some of those words, he says to God, It's time for a showdown. Just you and me. And, and so I'm, I'm sharing this because like some of you, that's kind of where you've been with prayer. And you're angry and you're upset and you're frustrated. Yet, isn't it beautiful that we open up God's word and right here, Paul reminds us in Ephesians how to pray. And so the first really takeaway I want you to take with you today as we look at this short text, men, remember this posture of humility. Pray from a posture of humility. And then I want you to look with me, starting now in verse 16. Here again, I'm going to remind you one more time. This would definitely be the place if you could envision someone kneeling down with you, praying this prayer over you, and just receive this. And I pray that out of his glorious riches, that he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power. Power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. And to know this love that surpasses knowledge. Why? So that you may be filled to the measure of all of the fullness of God. Woo! Somebody come on and pray a prayer like that over me. Amen? You receive that, don't you? And so if you just quickly break down some of what Paul says in those verses, what is he praying? He's praying that God, through his Spirit, would give us strength and power, that we would receive it in our inner being. Strength and power. Uh, in, in chapter 1, when we started this sermon series, verse 18, Paul has already talked about the same thing thing kind of he, he said this he said in a prayer that the eyes of our hearts would be enlightened and now that he prays again a similar prayer God enlighten them so that they might see your strength and, and your power let it be a part of their inner being I, I don't know about you guys but like I, I, I need that I, I need that daily weekly hourly moment by moment in life, uh, a, a pastor, author, a guy named Paul David Tripp, some of you know who this guy is. Um, I, I read a quote this week related to what he has to say about strength and power and how sometimes we completely miss it. Uh, look at this quote. He said, remember, it is not your weakness that will get in the way of God working through you, which is what most of us think. He says, it's not your weakness that's going to get in the way of God working through you, but your delusions of strength. His strength, we know Scripture says this, is made perfect in our weakness. And so what, what should we do? As believers, we should always be ready to point to His strength by being transparent and by being willing to admit like your own weakness. Man, that's, that's a beautiful part. You know, we've started to celebrate recovery ministry every Thursday night, a meal at six, large group at seven, small groups if you want to do that at eight. But in that small group time, that's it. Our strength is made perfect through his weakness. You know, in our weakness, rather, I should say. And, and so what the cool thing is in those groups, we, you know, it, it's just honesty. Man, man, here's what I'm struggling with. Here's how my week was. Here's what I'm going through. And people just being honest and open. Then continue, verse 17, back to the text. What else do we see here? Uh, Paul talks about that we might know the dwelling of Jesus Christ in our hearts through faith. And we, we might know that. Paul prays that Christ would dwell in you. Paul prays Christ would dwell in us, that his presence would be with us. And 
and live within our innermost being. And then he continues, he says the next phrase, that we will be firmly rooted in love. Does your life look like that? Like, do people, man, that, that brother, that sister, that dude, firmly rooted in love. Because I kind of feel like oftentimes if I look around in culture today, I see many people whose behavior does not look real firmly rooted in love, right? You know, here we are. It's July the 4th weekend. I'm having flashbacks to some scenarios that have played out with me in my, you know, fireworks journey where I'll go to downtown Nashville. You know, I stake out a place to sit. I I would go down there in the past like at 9 o'clock in the morning, you know, put out all my places, all my family. Here's all the, you know you know, dragging all the stuff, and like, I'm there the whole day in prime location, ready for the show. And then all of a sudden, you know, when it's like 15 minutes before showtime, crazy group comes in, and it's like, hey, we're we're just going to get right here. And I'm like, oh, you are, okay? You know, and so, like, I have been here since 9 a.m. Who are you, and why are you doing this? Because this is really not making me happy. And so the question just really is, am I firmly rooted in love am i firmly rooted in love well look back to the text verse 17 18 so i pray that you being rooted and established in love may have power what kind of power well power that's together in unity with all the lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of jesus christ Paul says, I I just want you to get it. I want you to comprehend the greatness of God's love. Our students, our teenagers, grades 6 through 12, are leaving for uh, camp on Thursday. They're going to be at camp up in Kentucky from Thursday until Monday. And um, some of you know this, some of you don't. I, I was in youth ministry for years, and literally I have been a part of or have led youth camps for almost 30 years. That's a lot of youth camp. And so hands down, absolutely, without a shadow of a doubt, what I have seen over and over and over, every single time I I have this opportunity, at camp, our teenagers and and the adults that go are, are removed somewhat from the majority of the distractions in this world. And so just that in itself is a really healthy, amazing thing. Why? Because it allows everyone at camp to have just a few days to comprehend how wide and how long and how high and how deep the love of Jesus Christ really is. And so God works, and we we see his faithfulness. And then on top of that, Paul says that, but then it's like he's going to ramp it up and take this prayer even to the next level. He prays, yes, I want them to comprehend the height, the depth, all that. But then he says, I want them to understand the greatness of God's love. And in verse 19, he prays that that we would understand how Christ's love, here's the word, surpasses. His love surpasses Christ our human ability to even understand. And it's kind of like he's saying, I know you're not going to get all this, but I pray as best you can, you will acknowledge how his love is so great that it surpasses what you can even comprehend. And then he kind of summarizes, he says, I just want it to overflow out of you. I want you to overflow with the fullness of Almighty God. So so real quick, what is he saying in this prayer? Because you can speak these same kind of prayers over people. He's saying, or or pray it for yourself. He's saying, Holy Spirit, give us strength and power. He starts there. He says, Lord, keep me rooted in your love. He goes to that. Then he says, Father, help us comprehend the greatness of your love. And finally, God, show me the fullness of all of who you are. Show me the fullness of God. And so if you just think about that and, you know, if you put it into one little takeaway, what, what what is this prayer all about? Is point number two. Man, we just need to pray to be filled by God. That's really what this part of the prayer is about. Then Paul concludes with a doxology. 
Y'all familiar with the doxology? Some of you, if you've been in church a long time, back in the day, it was very common for churches to close out a worship service by singing a song called the doxology. But when you look at it in Scripture, here's what's going on. Uh, There are many doxologies in the Bible, and it's always an expression uh, of gratitude to the Lord. It's often expressed in a very worshipful way, sometimes at the conclusion of worship. Now, what happened in the church that I grew up in, we would sing a doxology, oftentimes at the end of the service. Don't know what was up with my church. I feel like we only did this on Sunday night services. I don't know why we never did it on Sunday morning, but it was a Sunday night thing quite often. And some of you might, are are y'all tracking with me? Did any of you remember singing something like this in a church when you were a kid? And so the one we sang is probably the one you sang. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Whoa, I started too high. (laughs) Praise him, all creatures here below. Did you see that key change? That was weird, wasn't it? Don't hire me to be the worship pastor at Hope ever. (laughs) Praise Him above the heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Now, here's what's really weird. Most churches at the end of the little doxology would do, Amen. It's kind of this weird amen. Kind of sounds like a bee buzzing around your head. Amen. Interesting to me, when I was Googling doxology hymn to make sure I didn't mess up the words, the, the copy I found did not have the amen. So I really feel like at some point some really creative you know, worship leader, hey, what if we had an amen? And sometimes the amen was the longest part of the song, I feel like, but <laughs> I, my memory's bad. But so Paul... I told you all that so that I can set you up for his doxology in this prayer. And it's a beautiful verse. Look at verses 20 and 21. This is his conclusion to the prayer. Imagine him praying over you. He's got his hand on your shoulder. Now, God, here's the deal. Because we know, Lord, you are the one who is able to do immeasurably more than we can ask or imagine. And according to his power that is at work right now within us, Lord, to him, to God, be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. Like I look at that. And the Apostle Paul is completely mesmerized. He is captivated in prayer. And even in this doxology, this prayer, he is reminding us God is able. He's reminding you and me God is faithful. And so I'm I'm asking you today, consider your own prayer life. Are you so mesmerized? Are you so captivated in prayer? Like, you've got to answer this question. It's number three. Are my prayers like that? Are they involved or they are, are they just indifferent? <laughs> if you were here several weeks ago, I talked about the college student who was working on one of my teams. You remember his prayer before the meal? Rub-a-dub-dub, thanks for the grub. Like, that would be the indifferent prayer. <laughs> or, or are your prayers involved? You're captivated and mesmerized by the goodness of God. And Paul says in this doxology prayer, God is able to do immeasurably more than any of us can ever ask or imagine. So here we are. You're like, man, I I don't know, Kent. I don't know if God can answer this prayer I've been praying. And Paul says, he can. God can. You might, deep inside of you, think to yourself, I don't know if God can forgive me because of just the dark, secret sin in your life. He can. God can. You might think, man, how could the Lord use me? How could God actually use me to to take the gospel, whether that's to my next-door neighbor or like halfway around the globe? 
All I'm saying is he can. And so much of this is our willingness to trust him. Now, sometimes I give you like really clear takeaway applications. Sometimes I don't. Today is, is the trifecta of opportunity, Hope Fellowship Church. I, I'm going to give you three very clear examples of how you can live out and become engaged in the scripture this week. Maybe you do one. It's fine. Maybe you do two of the three. Fine. Maybe, maybe you do all three. And, you know, we're going to give away T-shirts next week that say, I'm a super Christian. Okay? God will guide you and give you discernment. Here's opportunity number one, just to remind you of the significance of being humble before the Lord. This week, I, I would ask you to find one day, just one day this week, to be alone with God. And instead of sitting in your comfy recliner or wherever you sit when you're having a quiet time, would you actually kneel before the Lord in prayer? Like, get on your knees. I realize a few of you may physically not be able to do that, but most of us can. Get on your knees in prayer this week. Application. Application number two. Um, we're giving out these wristbands as you leave today. I, I hope you'll consider getting a wristband. Uh, I've got Alex. I've got a name of a student. Uh, I just randomly was given a wristband, so I am committing this week to pray for Alex while our students are at camp. They leave Thursday. They come back Monday. This is my reminder. I'm going to wear it all week. Don't worry. It stays on in the shower and everything. And, and every time I look at this, I will be reminded, pray for Alex. But here's where we're going to take a step further. If you do this, what I am going to do and what I'm asking you to do is pray Ephesians 3, 14 through 21 over the person whose name is on your wristband. So, for example, For this reason I kneel before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on the earth is named. And God, today, I'm praying for Alex. That, God, you would show him the riches of all your glory. God, that today Alex would be strengthened in your power. God, that today he would know you in his inner being. God, allow Alex to know how Christ dwells in his heart. God, let him be deeply rooted in his faith and established in love. And so that's just what you do. It's just that that's how you pray scripture over someone. Opportunity number three. I'm pretty excited about this too. And... Uh, this, I don't know why I've never thought about this in my life, played out uh, through a conversation with a precious lady in our church one week ago today. Everybody jokes about these lifesavers, <laughs> peppermints we give out. If we've bought one bag of these at Sam's Club over the past 11 years, we have bought 300 mega bags of these things, probably more. I, I do not care if you get a handful every week. That's why they're there, and it's okay, okay? Here's what this precious lady said to me. Hey, Kent, I wanted to tell you something. Okay. She said, you know, every week I, I get a few of these mints, and she always enjoys one in the church service. And then she says, you know, one or two, I will, when I leave, I take them, and I, I put them in my car, cup holder, side compartment of the door. I don't know. I can't remember where she put it. Here's what she said. So sometime during the week when I'm in my car and I think, huh, I think I want a peppermint. When I reach in there to get the peppermint, she said, this is a reminder for me to say a prayer for you and your wife. awesome is that and so application point number three I'm, I'm not saying you got to pray for me but as you go out today if you're going to get a wristband might as well get a lifesaver too <laughs> we might need to restock the bucket forgot to do that after the first service somebody help me with that if you can um, would you be willing to grab a couple of lifesavers put them in your car and sometime this week when you feel like you need a hit of freshness on your breath voice a prayer for whoever it is. It could be a family member. It could be uh, a close friend. 
It could be someone that you've been thinking about, praying about on your oikos list. And just, just pray. And just pray. And see what the Lord does. Paul gave us this incredible model in Scripture. And now we have an opportunity to live it out. Would you bow your heads with me? Well, God, today, as your people, we've obviously, Lord, talked about prayer. And so, man, in this moment, I believe that many of us have received this beautiful prayer the Apostle Paul wrote to the church. Some of us, we, we needed that encouragement today. Uh, there are some of us who are, who are struggling, and, and we're that person that has really struggled with prayer for quite a while. And so, Lord, for those people, I ask that you would allow them to take on a posture of surrender and just say, okay, God, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to hold on to this anger and frustration, this Lieutenant Dan attitude, but God, let me, let me kneel before you. And then, God, let us all listen. God, we know that sometimes through prayer, your answer is yes. Sometimes your answer is no. Sometimes your answer is wait. So, God, let us be ready to receive as you guide. Now, Lord, for some in this room today, we, we have been thinking about for quite some time, what does it mean to be a follower of Jesus? What does it mean to surrender my life to him? What does it mean to be saved? And so, God, as only you can, would you draw those who hear my voice now, draw them to your precious son, Jesus, that they might know you and follow you. God, let us as a church be a praying church for your kingdom's glory. Thank you for the time we've had this morning. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.